The Story of Final Fantasy VI, Episode 1, A World of Balance. Good versus evil is one of the most fundamental concepts of fiction, and while many stories have a fair amount of moral ambiguity thrown in, most classic tales make a clear distinction between those in the right versus those in the wrong. Final Fantasy VI is one such story, as there's no doubt in who is good and who is evil, but it manages to distinguish itself through its extensive cast of characters and the development they share as they go through their journey to vanquish evil. This could be said for most of the Final Fantasy series, but Final Fantasy VI set a new bar with its unique roster of characters, a wealth of side content devoted to each character, and one of the most memorable villains of the entire franchise. I'll be walking us through the story of Final Fantasy VI, skipping over only small parts of side content. The story takes place in a world where technology reigns in the form of iron, gunpowder, and steam engines. One thousand years prior, a brutal conflict known as the War of the Magi occurred, during a time when magic reigned supreme. The war reduced the world to a scorched wasteland, and magic ceased to exist in the aftermath. Some people are interested in reviving the lost magical arts, however, which may prove to be a disastrous mistake. The story opens on a snowy mountainside, as three figures in robotic armor look out at a nearby mining town, Narshe. Two of them, Biggs and Wedge, are clothed in military uniforms, while the third, an unnamed female, is not. It seems that an esper was found in Narshe, a remnant from the War of the Magi that happened to survive all these years. The two soldiers were sent here to retrieve it with urgency by the Empire, and are accompanied by this female, whom they refer to as a sorcerer. They mention that she fried 50 of the Empire's armored soldiers in under three minutes, but the slave crown on her head prevents her from doing anything except following orders. The three march into Narche, where they are immediately attacked by the local guards. The town is no match for their advanced technology, however, and they sweep through into the mines. The guards refuse to easily give up the Esper, and send a monster known as Welk after the three, but it too falls. They finally approach the frozen Esper, but when the girl comes near it, it begins emitting an eerie light. There seems to be some sort of connection between the girl and the Esper, resulting in an explosion that knocks her unconscious. When she wakes, she's in a home in Narche, where she's greeted by an old man who removed her slave crown. She remembers that her name is Terra, and for some unknown reason, she was born possessing the natural ability of using magic, a trait unheard of in these times. The guards of Narche arrive and demand that the man give them Terra, so that the Empire will leave them alone, but instead the man lets her out the back door. She flees through the mines, but becomes cornered by guards and falls down a hole, knocking her out. We see a flashback of when the slave crown was put on her by a man working for the Empire named Kefka. The Emperor, Gestal, says that they stand on the brink of a major breakthrough in the total revival of magic. This, he says, is their destiny, and nothing will stand in their way. Meanwhile, a young man named Locke arrives at the old man's house, after being called to meet with a girl. Locke says that it better not have anything to do with that imperial witch, but the man says that Narshe's only hope is to join up with the Returners, a resistance group opposed to the Empire. He says that Terra had no control over her actions, but she could be convinced to understand their plight, and urges Locke to go after her. Locke manages to find Terra, just as a team of Narshe guards arrive to grab her. Locke is assisted by a group of Moogles, small, intelligent, furry creatures that live in the mines. The group defeats the guards, and Locke takes Terra out of the mines and Narshe, heading south. They arrive at a castle in the desert, 
Figaro, where they meet with King Edgar, a notorious flirt and secret member of the Returners. The two are granted safe harbor in the castle, while Tara thinks over what she should do now. She speaks with a matron who tells her of Edgar's twin brother, Sabin, who traded the throne for his own freedom. Unfortunately, the group has little time to relax, as Kefka pays a visit to Figaro under suspicion that Tara is there. Although Edgar is a member of the Returners, he pretends to be an ally to the Empire, and feigns ignorance about Terra. Kefka departs with an ominous threat, and Terra and Locke speak privately about the situation. Locke says that he's Edgar's contact with the Returners, and although they want Terra to join them, they won't push her. Terra is confused as she's been under the effects of the Slave Crown for so long, and she doesn't know how to make the right choice. Later, Edgar wakes to find the castle in flames as Kefka demands that he give up Terra. Fortunately, Edgar and Figaro have a trick up their sleeves, as the castle's advanced machinery allows it to burrow into the sand. Edgar, Locke, and Terra flee on chocobos as Kefka sends some armored soldiers after them. During the battle, Terra uses her magical abilities, shocking Edgar and Locke, who have never seen magic. After the battle, Edgar says that he'd like her to meet the leader of the Returners, a man named Bannon. Magic will be the key to winning this war even though Terra has no idea why she can use magic. Edgar remarks that no human is born with powers like that, which makes her even more confused about who she is and what she should do. For now, she agrees to meet with Bannon, meaning that the group will have to pass through a cave to South Figaro, then across Mount Colts to find the Returner's hideout. In South Figaro, the group chances upon a man dressed all in black. Edgar mentions that he seems familiar, and then recalls that this is a famed assassin known only as Shadow, and they best steer clear of him. While heading across Mount Colts, the group notices another individual seems to be shadowing them. They eventually encounter the individual, a martial artist by the name of Vargas, who suddenly attacks the group. During the fight, they are joined by Sabin, who reveals that he and Vargas both trained under Vargas's father, Duncan. Vargas believed that Duncan favored Sabin, and wanted him to become his successor. His jealousy led him to kill his father, despite Sabin insisting that he wanted Vargas to be his successor. In the end, the two duel, with Sabin pummeling Vargas, and emerging the victor. Afterwards, Sabin is formally introduced to Terra, who remarks that she thought he was just a bodybuilder who strayed from his gym. They explain the situation to Sabin, who agrees to join up with the Returners to fight against the Empire. The group heads down the other side of Mount Colts and enters the headquarters of the Returners, where they meet with Bannon. Bannon immediately asks if Terra is the girl who can speak with espers, and follows up by mentioning how she managed to kill 50 of the Empire's best soldiers in a few minutes. She doesn't remember any of this though, and it only serves to anger her. Bannon then tells her that she is their only hope of defeating the evil of the Empire, placing a pressure on her that she's not sure she can handle. She later speaks with Locke who says that the Empire jailed someone close to him, and he's hated them ever since. She speaks with Bannon again, who asks if she'll be their last ray of hope, but she's plagued with self-doubt, and wonders how anyone could place their hope in her. Suddenly a wounded resistance member arrives and informs them that the Empire has taken control of South Figaro, and they're on their way here. Locke rushes off to South Figaro to try and slow the Empire down, while the others flee with Bannon down the Leet River back towards Narche. The raft ride down the rapids is perilous, especially thanks to the group being attacked by a large octopus 
with a penchant for chatter. Although they defeat the octopus, Sabin leaps in the water after it to finish it off, and he gets caught up in the rapids, separating him from the others. Meanwhile, in South Figaro, Locke successfully gave the Returners some much needed time, but it takes some skill to escape from the occupied town. He manages to steal a couple of outfits, both from merchants and soldiers, and makes his way through a hidden tunnel underneath a mansion in town. Here, he finds one of the Empire's generals being chained up and tortured, Celeste. It seems that she's being branded a traitor by the Empire, although the reason why is not clear. Locke manages to easily free her, although she says she'd rather just stay here and accept her fate, as Locke wouldn't be able to protect her in her state. Locke assures her quite vehemently that he can protect her and the two make their way out of South Figaro. When asked why he's helping her, Locke says that she reminds him of someone, and that he just wants to. The two make their way through the cave back towards Narche, defeating an Imperial war machine in the process, thanks to Celeste's ability to cast magic, something that she was not born with. We'll learn more about that later. Back on the Leet River, Terra, Edgar and Bannon continue down the rapids, making their way back to Narche. Upon approach, however, the guards immediately recognize Terra and refuse them entry. Instead, Terra remembers a secret entrance into the mines that Locke used earlier, and they decide to take the long way around, eventually making it back to the old man's home. The man, Arvis, says that the town intends to stay completely neutral, despite his efforts to convince them to join the Returners. There's been a flurry of interest in the Esper, which hopefully Terra can sort out, and Edgar remarks that the Esper will either save them or dig them an early grave. Sabin, however, floated down the Leet River on his own, ending up quite a ways from Narche. Approaching a house nearby, he ends up finding the famous assassin, Shadow, who tells him that the Empire has set up a base nearby and plans to attack Doma Castle. Sabin needs to go past Doma to find a way back to Narche, so, in a surprising turn, Shadow offers to assist him, although he warns that he might take off at any moment if he feels like it. The two make their way south and stealthily approach the Imperial base. They overhear two soldiers discussing a rumor about Kefka planning to take over as general of the Imperial Army. It's clear that the soldiers have no respect for Kefka, although they do greatly fear him. They do have a good deal of respect for the current general, however, a man named Leo. The two also see Kefka is here at the base, and the Imperials launch their siege on Doma Castle. At Doma, most of the soldiers have given up hope, except for one man, the personal bodyguard to the king, Cyan. Cyan says that he will head out and slay the commander of the battalion, which will cause the other soldiers to flee. He engages the commander in a duel and kills him with a single strike from his katana. Back in the Imperial camp, the two eavesdrop on General Leo, who is also present. Although the soldier speaking with Leo wants to rush the castle to take it, Leo says that this would cost too many lives, and the Emperor doesn't want soldiers who throw their lives away for nothing. A message arrives from the Emperor, however, calling Leo away from the attack. With Leo gone, Kefka enacts his plan of poisoning the castle's water supply, killing most of the domans, including the king, as well as many of the Imperial soldiers present. Another tragic loss due to this is Cyan's wife and young son, causing Cyan to fly into a rage and rush the Imperial camp. Although Sabin and Shadow have no idea who he is, the enemy of their enemy is their friend, so they assist. There's nothing left here for Cyan, so he joins up with Sabin on his path back to Narche. The group travels through the Phantom Forest to the south, 
where they encounter a train in the woods. Although they note the oddity of such a thing, as Cyan states that he believed Doma's railway was destroyed, they board the train. After doing so, the train begins moving and the door seals itself shut, with Cyan realizing that this is in fact the Phantom Train, which carries the souls of the departed to the afterlife. They decide to try and head to the front of the train to shut off the engine, a task made all the more difficult by the copious amounts of hostile spirits aboard the train. Eventually, they reach the front of the train and find a way to shut it down, although the train of course reveals itself to be sapient, and it attacks the group. In a surprising show of strength, Sabin proceeds to suplex the train, and it allows them to be let off. While letting them off, however, Cyan sees his deceased wife and child boarding the train, allowing him to say goodbye to them one last time. The group continues, coming up to a massive waterfall which would lead them to the Velt, a dangerous area of plains. It's their best hope of finding a way back to Narshe, so Sabin and Cyan prepare to jump into the waterfall. Shadow, on the other hand, wants nothing to do with that, and takes his leave. The two survive the drop, and at the bottom, they are greeted by what seems to be a feral child, who runs away almost immediately. They stop by the town of Mobliz to restock on supplies, and while out on the Velt, they encounter the child once again, who says that he's hungry. They toss him some dried meat, earning his trust. The boy, called Gao, decides to join up with them in hopes of getting some more food, and offers them a gift in exchange, a shiny treasure he keeps in the mountains nearby. The group finds his treasure, a diving helmet that they can use to traverse the Serpent Trench, which should lead them to the town of Nikia, where they can charter a ship. How exactly the three of them utilize one diving helmet is a question best left unanswered, and they do eventually make it to Nikea. There they charter a boat to South Figaro, and sneak their way out and back to Narshe. In Narshe, Bannon is in the process of convincing the mayor of the town to support the Returners against the Empire. Sabin, Cyan, and Gao arrive and inform them of the poisoning at Doma, which the mayor rationalizes was done because of their affiliation with the Returners. Locke and Celeste then arrive and inform them that the Empire is marching on Narshe as they speak in pursuit of the Esper, regardless of the town's neutrality. He reveals that he knows this due to Celeste, formerly an Imperial General. Cyan flies into a rage and moves to attack her, as she was apparently responsible for a devastating attack on the town of Miranda. Locke jumps in between them to stop Cyan, saying that she's with the Returners now, and Terra tells him that she used to be with the Empire as well, leading Cyan to calm down. A platoon of Imperial soldiers is then sighted on approach to Narshe, led by Kefka. The people of Narshe had moved the frozen Esper up into the hills above the town, so the Returners gather near it in order to set up a final defense. Along the way, Edgar remarks to Celeste that Locke has a complicated past, so she shouldn't go thinking that he's falling for her. Celeste responds that she's a soldier, not some love-starved twit. She then reveals to Terra that she can use magic because she was artificially infused with it as a baby, and was raised as a Magitek knight. Terra then asks her if she's ever loved anyone, which she meant as an honest question about if magic prevents someone from feeling human emotions, but Celeste interpreted it as more of an insult. Regardless, Kefka and the soldiers arrive, and he remarks on how delightful it is that the traitor Celeste is here as well. The soldiers begin sweeping towards them, but the Returners put up a formidable defense, eventually combating Kefka himself. Kefka turns out to be not quite a pushover, despite his clownish appearance, 
capable of taking on four of the Returners at once. Still, they prove to be a bit too much for him to handle, and he flees. After the battle is over, the group approaches the Frozen Esper, where Terra begins forming a connection with it once again. She lets out a scream and a blast of force that nearly sends the others flying off the mountain, and begins asking the Esper who she is and what's happening to her. She then transforms into some sort of creature before emitting a horrific scream and flying off into the sky. Afterwards, Celeste remarks that she looked like an Esper, and that she flew off to the west. A few of the Returners decide to head out to find her, while the others stay behind in Narshe in case the Empire returns for the Esper. Locke, Sabin, Celeste, and Edgar head south to Figaro Castle, which is capable of burrowing into the ground and moving to the continent to the west. While well, at the castle, Sabin and Edgar spend some time reminiscing about the times before Sabin left. It seems that the king of Figaro passed ten years ago, and wanted the kingdom to be divided between the two brothers. Sabin, however, was furious, as it was fairly clear that the Empire poisoned their father, but no one wanted to go against them. Edgar also didn't want to run the kingdom and bow to the Empire, but he felt that they couldn't both leave the responsibility. Instead, he flipped a coin, with the winner allowed to choose their own path, with no regrets between them. Across the continent, they head into the town of Kolingen, where they hear that Terra was spotted flying south toward the town of Gidor. While in Kolingen, Locke pops into a small house, where in the basement he speaks to an old man watching over a deceased girl. The girl, Rachel, is the one that Locke failed to protect, and her body is now being preserved with herbs, while Locke searches for a way to bring her back. In Gidor, they learn that Terra was spotted flying into the northern mountains, where a population of criminals have formed a lawless town known as Zozo. They trek up into the mountains to Zozo, a dreary and dangerous place filled with criminals looking to attack the group and leave them in a ditch. They battle their way through and up towards the top of Zozo's tallest building, where they encounter a particularly troublesome thug guarding a door. After thrashing him and heading inside, they find Terra lying on a bed in a daze. An old man reveals himself to the group, stating that he is an esper named Ramu. Although most espers live in another world, some live here, even able to appear like humans and blend in. He goes on to explain that a long time ago, espers and humans lived side by side as friends, but when some humans began lusting for the power of the espers, the War of the Magi broke out. Humanity had started infusing themselves with magic taken from espers, becoming known as magi, and the espers decided that they'd rather flee from this realm, creating their own world. The magi were then wiped out by the rest of humanity, as they were blamed for the war. Around 20 years ago, Emperor Gestal stumbled upon the world of the espers, hoping to recapture their power. In response, the espers tossed the humans out and sealed their world off completely. Unfortunately, a number of espers were captured by the Empire and are being experimented on in the Magitech research facility. Ramu was in hiding to avoid a similar fate, but his magic brought Terra here as he sensed that she was in trouble. He can't really help her though and suggests to the others that they free the espers in the research facility, as one of them may be able to help. Currently the Empire is trying to extract every ounce of power from the espers while keeping them alive, but Ramu explains that an esper's true power can only be transferred once they've passed away and turned into a hardened crystal called magicite. Ramu gives the group some magicite of his fallen comrades before sacrificing himself and turning into magicite. 
Cyan and Gao arrive in Zozo, and the group discusses what to do, deciding that they have to put a stop to the Empire's research in order to prevent another War of the Magi. Celeste volunteers to head in, due to her knowledge of the facility, and Locke says that he won't let her go alone. They're joined once again by Edgar and Sabin. Unfortunately, the research facility is located on another continent entirely, and no boats travel there. The group heads back to Gidor for ideas, and end up bumping into a man who runs the opera house nearby, who briefly mistakes Celeste for a famous opera singer, Maria. The man accidentally drops a letter in which someone calling themselves the Wandering Gambler plans to make Maria their wife. They're told that this wandering gambler is a man named Setzer, who owns the world's only airship. They decide to head to the opera house to try and arrange a meeting with this Setzer. Speaking with the owner, he says that Setzer will likely swoop in during the climax of Act 1 to abduct Maria. Locke volunteers Celeste to act as a decoy, with Setzer abducting her instead believing her to be Maria. Celeste immediately objects to the plan, claiming that she's a general, not some opera floozy. Despite this, she realizes that it's their best bet of getting the airship, so she begins practicing. The opera begins, and Celeste puts on a rather convincing performance. But unfortunately, the octopus from the Leet River is here, and plans on dropping a massive weight from above onto Celeste as revenge against the group. Locke, Edgar, and Sabin head up into the rafters to stop him, but they all fall onto the stage. After some mediocre improvising from Locke, the show continues with an impromptu battle between the three and the octopus, in which it is quickly trounced once again. Afterwards, Setzer swoops in as expected and abducts Celeste, as the other three sneak aboard the airship as planned. After realizing that Celeste is not, in fact, Maria, Setzer tells them to get off his ship, but they continue to try and convince him to help the Returners. Setzer becomes smitten with Celeste, and says that if she agrees to become his wife, he'll help out. Celeste counters by offering him a gamble in the form of a coin toss. If it's tails, she'll marry him, but if it's heads, he has to help out. Setzer, of course, agrees, and the coin ends up falling on heads, although when he picks it up, he finds it to be a coin with identical sides, the very same that Edgar used to gamble against Sabin years ago. Setzer is pleased with her hustle, and agrees to join flying them over to the other continent. The group lands and approaches the research facility on foot, finding the entrance heavily guarded. A returner sympathizer nearby agrees to act as a distraction while they sneak in, however. Inside the facility, they find Kefka gloating about his newfound powers gained from the espers, and he proceeds to toss a couple of drained but still living espers down a garbage chute. The group follows them down the chute, and even though they've been drained, they still lash out in anger at them until they recognize Ramu's presence on them. Seeing that Ramu entrusted his power to them, the two, Shiva and Ifrit, decide to follow suit and turn themselves into Magicite in order to aid them. The group continues on, eventually coming to a room filled with espers inside of glass containers. They move to free them, but the espers instead decide to turn themselves into magicite in order to assist the returners against the Empire. As they do so, a man approaches them, Sid, the chief scientist of the Empire. Sid realizes that espers can only be fully utilized upon becoming magicite, and then notices Celeste is here. He then mentions a rumor that Celeste had infiltrated the Returners as a spy, something that shocks Locke. This is made worse by the sudden arrival of Kefka with some Magitek troops, who confirms that that's exactly what she did, although Celeste vehemently denies it to Locke. 
In order to prove it, she proceeds to teleport herself, Kefka, and the troops away from the facility, giving the others a chance to escape. Sid comes to the realization that the Empire has gone too far in pursuit of power, and he especially cares for Celeste, who he basically has raised since she was a baby. The group flees on a minecart out of the facility, while Sid says that he plans to speak with the Empire about stopping this war. After boarding the airship, Kefka tries to stop them once more using some massive cranes, but they still manage to escape. They head back to Zozo to check up on Terra, but upon approaching her, one of the magicite they received in the facility begins connecting with her, and she says that she now remembers everything. Terra's father was an esper named Modwin, who lived in the esper world. One day, a human woman ended up there, and Modwin began looking after her, soon falling for her. The other espers weren't pleased that a human was there, and she planned on leaving as soon as possible, but Modwin convinced her to stay, leading to the two having a child. Two years later, the Empire discovered the Esper world and launched an invasion. The Espers summoned a great wind to force them all out, but Terra and her mother ended up getting swept out as well. Emperor Gestal found Terra, realizing that she's a unique and powerful half-breed, and killed her mother before taking Terra. Back in the present, Terra turns back to her normal form, and begins to feel like she can control her powers now. The group, with Terra, heads back to Narshe to speak with Bannon, who informs them that Narshe has agreed to join their fight. Between Narshe's money and Figaro's advanced machinery, they plan on storming the Empire and wiping it out, except that they don't have nearly enough manpower. Bannon says that they need to open up the sealed gate to the Esper world, joining forces with the Espers. They'll need someone to forge a bond of trust with the Espers, and with Terra being the result of such a bond, she's the only candidate for the job. Growing more confident with her own nature, she agrees, and the group flies off to the sealed cave. They first come to the Imperial outpost with no soldiers present, which they note as being odd, but continue on. At the end of the cave, they come to the door to the Esper world, but they are approached by Kefka. Cyan, Sabin, and Edgar hold him off, while Terra reopens the gate, as Kefka says that it was all part of the Emperor's plan to let Terra escape so that she'd open the gate. Seeing as how they had Terra under control with the Slave Crown, and could have just forced her to do it, it's likely he's just taunting them again. Terra manages to open the gate, letting loose a torrent of wild and furious espers before the gate seals itself once again. The espers fly off towards the Imperial capital in a rage, and when the Returners attempt to follow them in the airship, they're struck down in the flurry, crash landing nearby. Fortunately, no one was injured, and they hoof it over to the capital, finding it a burning wreck. They head inside and speak with the Emperor, who claims to have had a change of heart in wake of this devastation. Sid is there as well, and explains that the Espers came in search of their brethren, but when they found out that they were all dead, they destroyed the place. Emperor Gastal wants to speak with the Espers, and convince them that they're not at war, so that they don't further devastate the planet. Gastal plans on holding a feast to celebrate the end of the war, although it hardly seems like the right time. Before the meal, the Returners speak to a number of soldiers, finding the majority of them glad for peace. During the banquet, they learn that Kefka had been jailed for his crimes, and Gestal again apologizes for the poisoning of Doma. He also says that Kefka was lying about Celeste being an Imperial spy, as she realized that the war was a mistake before anyone else. Now that his war is supposedly over, and they don't plan on harming Espers again, he wants the Returners to head to Crescent Island, where the Espers fled towards, in order to find them and form a truce. 
it's up to Terra to do this and bridge the gap. They'll be boarding a ship bound for the island, accompanied by General Leo, who also apologizes to Cyan for Kefka's poisoning. Afterwards, Locke says that if Terra is going, he'll go, but the rest of the Returners should stay here. None of them trust Castal so easily, so they plan on poking around a bit more to investigate. Terra and Locke make for the ship, where they are greeted by Leo, who tells them that they'll be accompanied by another of the Empire's generals, and a person he hired in town. The general is of course Celeste, and the hired person turns out to be Shadow, always interested in making some cash. Spending the night in the inn before departing, Locke confronts Celeste about doubting her loyalty, but she would rather not speak to him. On the boat ride over, Terra speaks with Leo, who says that because he knew she was being used as a biological weapon and didn't do anything about it, he's no better than Kefka. She asks him if she'll ever be able to love anyone due to being a half-esper, but Leo says that of course she will, she's just young. The answer isn't good enough for her, although Shadow overhears and tells her to keep in mind that there are many in this world like him who have killed their emotions. Arriving on Crescent Island, the group splits up, with Terra, Locke, and Shadow heading into the town of Tamasa to look for clues about the Esper's whereabouts. Unfortunately, they find the residents to be rather reclusive, with no knowledge of any Esper's. They do find an elderly man named Strago, who seems to have heard of Esper's before, but claims to be ignorant. He also has a granddaughter named Realm, who asks if these strangers can also use magic, but she's quickly hushed by Strago. She does however form a quick bond with Shadow's dog, Interceptor, despite him claiming that the dog doesn't like any strangers. The group spends the night in the inn, where they are awoken by Strago, who says that Realm was at a neighbor's house when a fire broke out, leaving her trapped. Terra and Locke leap to help, but Shadow curiously stays behind. Approaching the house, which has erupted into a blazing inferno, Strago utilizes magic to try and put out the flames, resulting in the mayor yelling at him about magic being forbidden. Left with no other option though, the entire town reveals that they can all use magic, and they all try to smother the flames to no avail. Terra, Locke, and Strago head inside of the house to try and rescue Realm before the whole place collapses. They find out that the source of the fire is actually magical in nature, due to too many fire rods being kept there, and although they find Realm unconscious and Interceptor with her, they are all knocked out by fire entities. Suddenly, Shadow leaps in and dispatches the entities, rescuing the entire group. Afterwards, Strago reveals that this town is descended from Magi survivors of the War of the Magi, who went into hiding to avoid being hunted down like animals. Although their powers have weakened over time, they still have access to magic, but they keep this a closely guarded secret to avoid being hunted down again. As thanks for saving Realm, he agrees to help locate the Espers, who are likely hiding in the mountains nearby due to the powerful magical properties inherent there. Shadow decides that he'll search for the Espers his own way, and says that he only rescued them because he wanted his dog back. On the other hand, Realm desperately wants to go with, but Strago forbids it. The three of them head into the mountains, eventually coming across three small statues radiating magical power. Strago explains that these statues were likely made by espers in the image of three gods that apparently created magic. The warring triad, as they're known, battled with one another, and mortals that got caught in their way became espers, slaves to be used for their war. Eventually the triad realized the war was folly, and sealed themselves away by turning to stone. After the War of the Magi, the espers that fled to their own realm took the petrified gods with them, placing them in a delicate position, 
as moving them out of alignment would cause a catastrophe of wild magical energy. The espers that flew out of their realm were likely drawn here due to the magical energy of these facsimile statues. As they move to continue exploring, they are attacked by the octopus once again, and during the battle Realm shows up, revealing that she followed them. She proves to be not quite so defenseless however, and uses her unique artistic abilities to paint a magical portrait of the octopus, resulting in him having a bit of an existential crisis and fleeing. The others admit that she might be handy to have along, and continue, eventually discovering the espers hiding deep in the mountains. Although tensions are initially high, one of the espers senses a familiar power radiating from Terra, and reveals that they had been waiting near the gate and pondering a way to rescue their brethren held captive in this world. Terra had felt their presence through the gate, but when it was opened, they lost control. They are deeply sorry for the pain they have caused, and agree to go to Tamasa to speak with General Leo about a truce. At Tamasa, both the Espers and Leo apologize for the actions they've done in the past, and agree to peace. Unfortunately, Kefka then shows up with Imperial soldiers, and proceeds to use his growing magical ability to slay the Espers present, converting them to Magicite and increasing his power further. He then orders the destruction of Tamasa, despite Leo's protests. Leo draws his sword on Kefka, but Kefka seems unfazed before disappearing. Emperor Gastal then appears, and tells Leo that his goal has always been to gain magicite and grow more powerful. Gastal is then revealed to simply be an illusion created by Kefka, who ambushes Leo and murders him. The sealed cave then reopens, as the remaining espers sense the bloodshed and burst out to help, but Kefka has grown too powerful, and simply slaughters the majority of them. He then leaves Tamasa, heading towards the Esper realm. The Returners survive the massacre, and grieve for Leo. The rest of the Returners arrive at Tamasa, with Edgar revealing that he learned about the Empire's plan from the girl who brought them tea. After the rest are introduced to Strago and Realm, they decide to head back onto the airship to rethink their plans now that Kefka has amassed so much power. Unfortunately, Kefka and Gestal have made it to the sealed gate, although the Espers had opened it themselves to try and fight him. They enter the Espers realm and find the actual statues of the Warring Triad. Kefka utilizes the unimaginable magical power emanating from them to literally tear the island containing the sealed cave out of the earth and into the sky, creating a floating continent. From there, Gestal and Kefka plan on ruling the entire world with an iron fist. The Returners are the only ones who can stop them, so Terra, Sabin, and Edgar begin flying the airship up towards the continent. On the way, they are attacked by the Imperial Air Force, alongside the Octopus once again. They eventually land onto the floating continent, where they find Shadow, who says that the Empire tried to kill him after he outlived his usefulness. They're not just going to leave him behind, so he joins up to help stop the Empire. As they approach the Warring Triad, they find it protected by an ancient biomechanical monster created during the War of the Magi. Although it puts up a tremendous fight, they eventually put it down and approach Gestal and Kefka, where they are joined by Celeste. The group is easily knocked aside by Gestal's power from the Triad, and the two offer Celeste a position of power if she agrees to kill the others. Although she takes the sword from Kefka, she says that power only breeds war, and she wishes she had never been born. She then suddenly turns and stabs Kefka, sending him into a rage. Kefka steps in between the Warring Triad in order to awaken them and absorb their power. This goes too far for Gestal, who tries to convince him that this would destroy the world they're trying to rule. 
Gastal learns an important lesson here in appointing a maniacal clown as your number two, and when he goes to attack him with his new magical power, he finds that the triad's field of energy nullifies all magic. Kefka then calls to the triad to show him their power and annihilate Gestal, which they do. Kefka shoves Gestal's corpse off of the continent and proceeds to reposition the triad, laughing while doing so. It's too late now to stop it, but Shadow swoops in once again to save the day, trapping Kefka temporarily within the triad's field. The others take the opportunity to flee towards the waiting airship. They cut it close to the wire though, as they wait for Shadow, who shows up at the last moment. The unimaginable power of the triads cascades out of control, tearing the world apart. The airship is torn in half in flight, and the returners are scattered. Kefka had gotten his wish, and on that day, the world was changed forever. The Story of Final Fantasy VI, Episode 2 a world of ruin. The world's worst nightmare had come to pass. Kefka, a maniacal figure driven mad with power, had uprooted the source of all magic and intentionally threw it into chaos, resulting in the entire planet being devastated. The Returners, the resistance group that had fought so hard to defeat the Gestalian Empire, were scattered during the event and the world is now left with no hope of things ever returning to a time of peace. A world of balance has become one of ruin, but the story doesn't end there, and all hope might not yet be lost. Despite all odds, Celeste wakes up from the airship crash in a small cabin with none other than Sid next to her. He informs her that she was in a coma for an entire year, and he's been watching over her this whole time. They're on a small deserted island, and for all Sid knows, they may be the only two people left alive on the planet as it continues to slide into ruin. Celeste begins to accept that all of her friends are likely gone, and she decides to just try and live a quiet life here with Sid, whom she begins to call Granddad. Unfortunately, Sid is not well as he's recently fallen ill and hasn't eaten anything for three days. Celeste makes her best attempt to gather fish for Sid, but he continues to grow weaker, and before long, he passes away. In her grief and despair at losing the last person in the world that she knows, she heads up to the cliffs at the edge of the island. Left with no hope, she throws herself from the cliffs. Miraculously, she awakes once more on the shores of the island, finding a pigeon with a bandana tied around its wing that seems to have belonged to Locke. With renewed hope, she finds a letter from Sid in the cabin telling her to not give up, and he points her to a raft in the basement that he spent the last year working on. Celeste sails on the raft, ending up on the nearby continent, noting the massive tower in the center of the land. In the town of Albrook, she learns that the tower belongs to Kefka, who resides at the top and uses the power of the three statues in the form of a light of judgment to smite anyone who opposes him. She also learns that a number of great, long-sealed monsters were released when the world was split open. Celeste heads north to the town of Zen, where a house suddenly begins collapsing in the middle of the town. She approaches and finds Sabin holding it up in another incredible feat of strength. He tells her to head in and rescue the child that's inside while he keeps the place from collapsing. She manages to rescue the kid in the nick of time, speaking with Sabin afterwards, who says that a minor thing like the end of the world wouldn't do him in. Celeste says that she had given up all hope 
but now she knows that they're all still alive, so they need to find them, smash Kefka, and deliver peace unto the world. The two head across the continent, utilizing the inverted Serpent's Trench, ending up in the town of Mobliz, where they find a great deal of children in hiding, along with Terra. The two are glad to see her, and tell her that they're going to gather everyone and fight Kefka, but Terra says that she can no longer fight, instead focusing on protecting the children of this town after all the adults were killed by Kefka. Staying here and watching over the children has given her a feeling she's never felt before, and even though she doesn't know what's going on inside of her head, she doesn't have the will to fight. As Celeste and Sabin leave without her, the town is attacked by Funbaba, one of the ancient monsters that was released. Terra tries to take it out on her own, but is quickly knocked out, forcing Celeste and Sabin to step in. The two manage to fend Funbaba off, but this only serves to reinforce Terra's decision to no longer fight. Celeste and Sabin leave empty-handed, and head across the continent to the town of Nikia. The town seems to be doing well enough, with buildings intact and trade still bustling. In the cafe, they come across a gang of criminals that escaped from prison recently, and met up with a man named Gerard. Gerard apparently wants to lead the group into the basement of Figaro Castle, where a large amount of treasure is located. The castle is currently stuck underground, and they have knowledge of a secret way in. While roaming the market, Celeste and Sabin bump into Gerard, who bears a striking similarity to Edgar. When questioned about this, Gerard claims to have no idea what they're talking about and proceeds to board a ship along with the gang. Celeste and Sabin sneak aboard and follow the group into Figaro Castle, continuing down into the basement. At the back of the basement, in the large engine room that allows the castle to move, they find a massive quantity of worms covering the engines. Gerard tells the criminals to continue on while he deals with the worms, and then turns and asks Celeste and Sabin if they're going to help. After dealing with the worms, the three of them hide as the criminals make their way out, and Edgar explains that he had used the criminals to get here, as they had knowledge of a secret entrance into Figaro. With the castle functioning once again, the group moves it across the sea to the desert near Kolingen. Sitting in the cafe is none other than Setzer, who has fallen into a depression after the end of the world and the loss of his airship. It doesn't take long, however, for Celeste to convince him to help, and he says that they need to go to a nearby tomb in order to get another airship. The tomb belongs to a friend of Setzer's named Daryl, and is unfortunately crawling with monsters. In the back of the tomb is Daryl's coffin, and behind a hidden door nearby is a long flight of stairs. While descending, Setzer explains that Daryl was a rival and dear friend that owned an experimental airship known as the Falcon. She was reckless though, and at one point she attempted to break all of the records in order to become known as the woman who flew closest to the stars. They eventually found the wreck of the Falcon a year later, in a distant land. Setzer repaired the craft and put it to rest down in this tomb, as he couldn't bear to look at it. The time has come where it just might help save the world though, so he fires it up and they fly out of the ocean into the wild blue yonder, or orange in this case. Shortly after liftoff, Celeste spies a pigeon flying towards the town of Miranda, and believing that it might lead her to Locke, they follow it. They don't find Locke in the town, however, instead finding a woman who's been communicating with her boyfriend via messenger pigeons, with her claiming that he lives in Mobliz. Mobliz is where Terra currently is, where all the adults of the town were wiped out by Kefka, so something doesn't add up. One of the recent letters she's received seems to be written in Cyan's handwriting, and the group decides to follow a pigeon back to where this boyfriend is located. 
The pigeon heads up into the mountains above the town of Zozo, and after making the climb through the relatively untouched town, they find a mountain cave containing an unsent letter from Cyan. In the letter, he explains that her boyfriend passed away some time ago, and he's been writing in his stead. He implores the woman not to let the past destroy her life, as it's time to look forward, rediscover love, and embrace the beauty of life. They then meet up with Cyan, who's glad they're alive and is eager to join up with them again, although he's extremely embarrassed about the letters. He explains that he heard about this woman who continued to send letters but never received a reply, causing something inside of him to snap. He realized that he was just like her in a lot of ways, only looking behind him and filled with despair. But then something changed, although he doesn't elaborate. He does mention that he bumped into Gao at one point, who said that he needed to become stronger if he was going to fight Kefka, so he likely went back to the Velt. The group fires up the airship again and heads over to the Velt, where they quickly bump into Gao, who is also eager to rejoin. While roaming the Velt, they stumble across a cave, where they spot none other than Interceptor, Shadow's dog, who runs further into the cave. As it's unlikely the two would be separated, the group continues through the cave system, eventually stumbling upon the unconscious form of Shadow, who was recently mauled by a large beast. After slaying the creature, they take Shadow to the nearby town of Tamasa so that he can recover. Afterwards, since they're close by, the group decides to check back in on Terra in Mobliz to see if she's changed her mind. Apparently, the two teenagers living in the town are going to have a baby soon, with Terra providing what help she can. While conversing with her though, Funbaba attacks the village once again, forcing the group to rush out to fend him off. Despite their strength in numbers, Funbaba blasts a couple of them away, at which point Terra comes out and transforms into her Esper form in order to join the fight. With Terra's assistance, they defeat Funbaba once and for all, although when the kids rush out of their homes, they quickly become frightened at Terra's morphed appearance. They soon realize that it's Terra, however, and she realizes that she loves these children, and she can fight if it means protecting their future. There's no future for them if Kefka isn't defeated, so she joins the group as well. They fly back to Tamasa to check in on Shadow, but they don't find him. One of the townspeople mentions that he apparently went to the Colosseum that was set up during the last year. Shadow had been seeking a powerful weapon, which is why he ended up in that cave, and he now is trying his luck at the Colosseum. Lucky for the group, they actually found that weapon in the cave, but failed to mention it to him. They fly over to the Colosseum, where items can be bet in gladiatorial combat in order to win potentially more valuable items, and they bet the weapon. Sure enough, Shadow makes an appearance, and after claiming that all he knows how to do is fight, agrees to join them in their fight against Kefka. Continuing on their exploration in order to find the rest of their companions, the group stops in South Figaro where they end up speaking with the wife of Sabin's martial arts mentor, Duncan. His wife claims that Duncan is still alive, currently meditating just north of Narshe. Sabin is eager to see for himself that Duncan still lives, so they fly over, eventually finding a small hut in a forest, where they are greeted by Duncan. He claims that the earth yawned open to take him, but he scrambled to safety. He then says that he has developed a new technique, and teaches it to Sabin in order to complete his training, so that he can smash Kefka. Since they're nearby, they stop by Narshe, which is largely abandoned. They're greeted by a thief as they enter, who says that there isn't much here, aside from one Mughal living in the mines, and a bunch of locked doors. Since Terra knows the Mughals to be friendly, 
They are intrigued by a solitary one still living in the mines, so they seek it out. They find it in the former Mughal village, and discover that it can speak normally, referring to itself as Moog. Moog says that Ramu came to him in a dream, and told him to expect the group's arrival. For whatever reason exactly, Moog decides to join the group in their fight, and mentions that there's a Sasquatch living in the mines that would be helpless without him. Apparently, Moog had once shared some food with the Sasquatch when he collapsed from exhaustion, so when they find him, he'll order him to join them. Exploring the rest of the mines, they end up on the top of the mountain, where the frozen Esper is still located. Upon approaching it, however, it lashes out and attacks the group, forcing them to defend themselves. After a short while, however, they manage to break and thaw the ice surrounding the Esper, and it comes to its senses. It can tell that the group are not enemies of the Espers, and seek to bring about peace, so it converts itself to magicite that they can use. Behind where the Esper was, they find another entrance into the mountain, and after poking around some more, they come across a small den belonging to some sort of creature. In a bone carving in the den, they find a piece of magicite shoved into it, but after removing it, they are swiftly attacked by a furious Sasquatch. After defending themselves, it calms down, and Moog says that he is the Sasquatch's boss, ordering him to join them. The Sasquatch, known as Umaro, accepts immediately, clearly possessing a strong sense of honor despite his primitiveness. With a couple of furry creatures on board, the team heads to a tower on the uprooted Serpent's Trench that was inaccessible by foot. Here they find a number of cultists that have devoted themselves to Kefka out of fear of his power. Among their number is Strago, who doesn't even seem to notice the group or speak to them. Rather than dragging him away by force, they decide instead to seek out his granddaughter, Realm, and hope that she can knock some sense into him. They end up in the town of Jidor, which has remained relatively unscathed from Kefka's destruction. They overhear from a resident that a wealthy man named Ozer has apparently recruited a highly skilled artist to come and paint for him, and someone else mentions that a young girl recently went into his home. Intrigued by the possibility that the artist is none other than Realm, the group heads into Ozer's mansion, which proves to be a confusing maze of recursive rooms and horrible monsters. In the end, they find both Ozer and Realm, but there seems to be a monster embedded in a large painting that Realm is working on, forcing the group to thrash it. Afterwards, Ozer explains that he bought a strange stone at an auction, and he felt compelled to have a painting of the Esper Starlet made. He ended up hiring Realm to paint it, but the monster had been attracted to the stone for some reason. The stone turns out to be Starlet in magicite form. Realm joins the group, and they head back to see Strago at the Cultist Tower. Upon arrival, Realm berates the old man, who immediately snaps out of his trance and rejoins the group as well. The pair wish to return to visit their home in Tamasa, but upon arrival they learn that Strago's friend and monster hunter Gung Ho has been injured. The monster responsible is known as Hidan, a legendary creature that both Strago and Gung Ho had hunted in their youth, but were never able to kill. Gung Ho asks Strago to avenge him, and although Strago initially hesitates, he agrees to hunt down the beast. The group travels to the nearby island of Ebot's Rock, and after a brief foray through a dark and cramped cave system, they come face to face with Hedon. The creature proves to be just as ferocious as the legends claim, and it's clear that without his allies, Strago would have never been able to defeat it. Fortunately, the group is successful, and they return to Tamasa, with Strago later regaling Gung Ho with a perhaps less than accurate recount of the hunt. 
Afterwards, Realm reveals to Gung Ho that she knew he was faking his wounds, but she thanks him for giving her grandfather the motivation to defeat something that had tormented him for decades. With their business finished in Tamasa, the group briefly pays their respects at General Leo's gravesite before continuing on. They decide to take the time to visit Edgar and Sabin's home next, Figaro Castle. During their visit, they have the castle submerged to travel underground, but the castle ends up bumping into something on the way. That something turns out to be a small cave system, which the group begins to explore. To their shock, they discover an entire ruined castle underground, and Terra reveals that this is a castle spoken of in legend, a relic of the War of the Magi, a millennium ago. The legends state that a battle took place here between the Esper Odin and a powerful sorcerer. As they explore the great hall of the castle, they find the frozen form of Odin, who turns into a magicite shard upon their touch. In the Queen's chambers, they find a bookshelf containing her diary, which reveals that she was secretly in love with Odin, despite that love breaking every rule of her society. She vowed that after the fighting was over, she was going to bear her soul to him, but she never got the chance. Tara remarks on the fact that a human could love an esper, a concept she's been struggling with. In a hidden passage beneath the castle, the group finds the petrified remains of the queen herself. Upon approach, rather than crumbling, the statue emits a single tear. This tear imbues the Odin Magicite with power, transforming it into the even more powerful Raiden. With nothing else remaining here, the group departs the ruins and returns to the airship. Since they're on a tour of revisiting people's homes, their next stop is the former home of Cyan, Doma Castle. The castle is vacant and partially ruined, but despite the eerie locale, the group decides to spend the night in the tragic fortress. The following morning, however, Cyan doesn't wake and three young boys suddenly enter the room. They introduce themselves as Curly, Larry, and Mo, the three dream stooges, and state that they lay claim to Cyan's soul before somehow leaping into him. The group gives pursuit, entering into Cyan's mind, where they are swiftly split up. It takes them some time to navigate the confusing and hostile landscape in order to join back up again, at which point they confront the three brothers. The lads put up a good fight, aided by the fact that the group was missing Cyan and his sword, but they are eventually defeated as well. Afterwards, they suddenly find themselves in a strange version of the Ghost Train, where they see a dream version of Cyan progressing along the train. When the group gets to the engine room, they end up walking out and transporting again, now to a dream version of a mine, with them all wearing Magitech armor. They continue to chase after Cyan, eventually plummeting off of a bridge, ending up in a dream version of Doma Castle, where they're greeted by the memories of Cyan's wife and child. His wife urges them to save her husband as he continues to torment himself over his failures in protecting his king, his people, and his family. A demon known as Rex Soul, made up of countless souls that had been dispatched in meaningless wars, has now latched on to Cyan. The group progresses to the castle's throne room, where they find Rex Soul and an unconscious Cyan. Rexol tells them that it's too late for Cyan, as nothing can stop his feelings of rage and despair at this point. The group has to try regardless, and a battle ensues, with Rexol utilizing its unique capabilities to possess them during the fight. What could have been a terrifying encounter is made rather simple with the healthy application of the Esper Raiden 
and Cyan awakes upon Rexol's defeat. He thanks the others, but when the dream versions of his wife and child appear, he tells them that he couldn't do anything to save them, and he's a man without honor. His family assures him that he has too much honor, and they'll always be by his side. Afterwards, the group departs the dream, and Cyan says that he must leave the past behind, as he still has much to live for. With his soul cleared of doubt and confusion, Cyan reaches his peak level of swordsmanship, and is now fully prepared to take on Kefka. After departing the castle, the group is reminded of a rumor that they heard on their travels of a small triangular island north of the Velt, said to be home to a monster that could suck up an entire ocean. As legendary monsters are their bread and butter, and a monster like that could have vacuumed up all sorts of treasure, they decide to seek it out. It doesn't take long after arriving on the island for the monster to find them, and despite their efforts, it proceeds to draw them into its belly. To their amazement, the creature's stomach is massive and contains not only various treasures, but other smaller monsters. After navigating the hazardous interior and picking up everything they find, the group comes across a mysterious individual resting in the back, shrouded in odd clothing. The individual introduces themselves as Gogo, -Go, a master of miming. What exactly Gogo -Go is doing here is unclear, but when the group tells them of their mission, Gogo -Go says that it sounds like fun, and joins. How exactly the group departs the creature's interior is perhaps better left undiscussed, but either way they end up back on their airship. There's only one member of the group left to be found, Locke. Based on various comments they've heard along the way, Locke has been searching the world over for a specific fabled treasure. Additionally, there are rumors that Emperor Gestal hid a legendary treasure in a cave system where the mountains form a star. Flying across the sky, the location becomes clear and is revealed to be known as the Phoenix Cave. Due to the unique nature of the cave system, they're forced to split off into two separate groups to navigate it. The Phoenix Cave proves to be quite hazardous filled with dangerous monsters, lava pits, and traps, likely set by the Empire to ward off would-be thieves. Each of the two groups finds plenty of treasure chests throughout the cave, but they turn out to be completely empty, meaning that some clever thief beat them to the punch. After draining some lava to clear their way, fighting a massive red dragon, and joining back up, they finally reach the end of the cave. Here they find Locke looting the last treasure chest. Locke is glad to see them alive and well, and reveals the legendary treasure, a piece of magicite containing the Esper Phoenix. Legends state that this magicite would be capable of restoring someone to life, although Locke is worried as it has many cracks in it. Celeste asks him if this is for Rachel the girl that Locke blames himself for failing to save. He says that he's lost all sense of purpose since losing her, and his life has no meaning until he can right this terrible wrong. The group returns to Colingen, where Locke places the magicite onto Rachel's body. It doesn't seem to have any effect, but suddenly the magicite begins to glow, and an image of a phoenix flashes before them, before Rachel awakes. Locke is overjoyed, as Rachel tells him that she's dreamed of seeing him and hearing his voice, but the phoenix has only given her a brief amount of time. She says that she was so happy when she was with him, and when the Empire attacked Kolingen, she thought only of him in her last moments. She says that she'll always love him, but he must cast off the anguish he's been harboring inside of him. He has to learn to love himself again, and regain his self-respect. 
Rachel's final act is to give her life to Phoenix, restoring its power. Although he's saddened by losing Rachel once again, he's strengthened by the closure that Phoenix provided, and he rejoins the group to help destroy Kefka. With the whole gang back together, alongside some new faces, and all of their preparations complete, it's finally time to breach Kefka's tower and confront the madman himself. Upon approach, Celeste has some misgivings, stating that if they destroy the three statues that are giving Kefka his power, it's likely that espers and magic will disappear from this world. She wonders what will happen to Terra in that case. Terra is willing to accept whatever consequences occur, however, and they enter the tower from above. Again, due to the unique nature of the tower and its defenses, they have to split up, this time into three smaller groups. Terra, Gogo, Cyan, and Setzer form one group, Celeste, Sabin, Shadow, and Strago form a second, and Locke, Moog, Edgar, and Umaro form the third, with Realm and Gao providing backup support. The Bizarre Tower is a twisted amalgamation of stone and metal, incorporating different parts of various factories, castles, and facilities into itself, and is filled with some of the most dangerous creatures in existence. Each group frequently gets stopped by various obstacles and has to wait for one of the other groups to assist. Celeste's group encounters a more powerful version of the Ultima weapon they encountered on the floating continent, while Locke's group encounters a terrifying monster known as Inferno, as well as a hulking guardian automaton. Eventually, each of the groups comes face to face with one of the three warring triad, demon, fiend, and goddess. With each being a literal source of magical power, none of them are easy, but it turns out that Kefka has drained them of much of their power. This means that, upon their destruction, magic does not yet go away, so the Returners join together on a platform facing Kefka. Kefka, now completely insane with power, welcomes them and demonstrates his capabilities by effortlessly tossing them around. Terra exclaims that people will continue to rebuild everything that he destroys, but he just says that he'll continue to destroy asking why people would cling to life knowing that they can't live forever. He says that their lives are meaningless, but Terra responds that it's not the net result of one's life that's important, but rather the personal victories and the celebration of life and love. Kafka mockingly asks if she's found any joy in this nearly dead world, prompting each member of the group to state what they've learned along the way. Terra now knows what love is, Locke has learned to celebrate life and the living, Cyan has come to accept that his family lives on inside of him, Shadow has learned what friendship and family is, Edgar now has the dream of building a kingdom in which he can guarantee freedom and dignity, Sabin has come to appreciate the love of his brother, Celeste has met someone who can accept her for what she is. Strago's joy is in his granddaughter, Setzer's is his friend's airship and her love, and Moog has gained a new group of friends. These statements only serve to sicken Kefka, who says that they sound like chapters from a self-help booklet. In his maniacal rage, he unleashes the light of judgment across the world, destroying even more of it, while exclaiming that he will create a monument to non-existence. Terra responds that life will go on regardless, as there will always be people and dreams. It's clear that there's no talking Kefka down, so the group prepares their weapons and engages. Kefka retreats to the top of his pillar, forcing the group to fight their way up. The Pillar of Monstrosities contains a number of extremely powerful creatures, and with no time to breathe in between, it proves to be a relentless gauntlet. 
Finally, at the very top of the pillar is Kefka himself, now more closely resembling Satan than a clown. Kefka, now the singular embodiment of all the magic in the world, is the greatest foe the Returners would ever face, casting extremely powerful magic such as Ultima. Indeed, he's far more powerful of an individual than any one of the group, but together they prove to be stronger, and Kefka is finally defeated at last. With Kefka slain, magic begins to fade, and his tower begins to crumble, forcing the Returners to swiftly flee. Terra quickly collapses as their magicite starts to shatter, but she manages to get back on her feet to help lead the others out. What follows is an extended sequence showcasing the group working together to navigate the tower, with each character being given their own spotlight. As one of the most memorable ending sequences of the 16-bit era, I'm going to let this one play out in its entirety, so enjoy.
Finally, the group all makes it back aboard the airship, with Terra flying alongside it as the last Magicite fades away. As Terra begins to fall from the sky, Setzer makes a sudden maneuver through the clouds, managing to catch Terra mid-fall. To everyone's relief, she doesn't fade away, as her human side is enough to keep her here. With that, the group continues to sail through the skies of a saved world, its people free to live their lives without the threat of destruction. The world is a long way from returning to normal, but thanks to the heroic efforts of the Returners, time will eventually bring it back to a world of balance. Final Fantasy VI is far from the first game to showcase an expansive cast of characters and present an emotional and layered story, but it's easily one of the most important and beloved RPG titles of the 16-bit era. In later years, Square Enix and the gaming public at large would end up giving far more attention to the next game in the series, Final Fantasy VII, but VI often shows up in various best-of lists, from best Final Fantasy, to best Super Nintendo game, to even the best video game of all time. A very major reason for this is because of the extremely memorable cast of characters and the story they're involved in, so I hope that I've done justice to the game in this summary, and I encourage you to play this masterpiece for yourself if you haven't already done so.